Welcome. My name is Kent Hill, and I am the Senior Fellow for Eurasia, the Middle East, and Islam for the Religious Freedom Institute. The Religious Freedom Institute is committed to achieving broad acceptance of religious liberty as a fundamental right, a source of individual and social flourishing, and the cornerstone of a successful and stable society. Religious freedom is important because religion is important. RFI is particularly interested in the societal and cultural factors, conditions, which either contribute to or undermine the good which can come from a society where all citizens, believers and non-believers alike, are free to fully participate in defining and achieving the common good. Now, today is the fourth and final webinar on the topic of truth, virtue, and the common good in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Let me give you a little background to why we chose this topic. In the United States today, and in Canada, and in Europe, there's widespread and growing skepticism, even despair, about finding common ground, about what is true, about what is good. Old words, phrases, and notions talk of natural law, natural rights, human nature. They're considered irrelevant, wrongheaded, or simply impossible to agree on. Everything seems to be in flux. There is painful, even nasty polarization, which infects the body politic and our various cultures. The basic question before us today is, do the monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have something to offer to a society unsure of how or whether we can ever agree on what is true, on what advances the common good? Now, during our first three webinars, we have been privileged to talk for an hour with prime re representatives of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But before I reintroduce them, Rabbi Novak, Professor Fennis, and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, let me introduce my friend and uh, co-moderator, Ismail Royer, who's the director of the Islam and Religious Freedom Action Team. Ismail. Hi, Ken. Thank you. And um, we are deeply, deeply blessed to be here with such a distinguished uh, panel of scholars. Um, this kind of uh, this kind of gathering is very rare indeed, and I'm just uh, very grateful to God and um, to be part of this uh, to be part of this conversation. I'm looking forward to uh, to gaining wisdom from these three uh, distinguished men. Trying to turn off my phone it turns out to be more difficult than I thought. <laughs> These technology. Hard, these hard yeah. technological questions are difficult. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Ismail. Sure. I want to say a word about the three our three panelists today. We're really fortunate to have them. Rabbi David Novak is considered by many to be the premier Jewish theologian in the world. He holds the shift chair in Jewish studies as professor of religion and philosophy at the University of Toronto, where he has been since 1997. He's the author of 19 books and numerous articles. He's served as a pulpit rabbi and a hospital chaplain, and he's on the board of advisors for the Religious Freedom Institute. Professor John Finnis is one of the most respected scholars in the world of moral, political, and legal theory and of common law, constitutional law. He is a fellow of both philosophy and the law sections of the British Academy. He taught law and philosophy for 45 years at Notre Dame University, taught for 25 years at Notre Dame in Indiana, and uh, um, was there, just retired from that post uh, not long ago, last year, in fact. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is one of the most outstanding Muslim scholars in the world, and he's the founder, co-founder, I should say, and president and head faculty member of Zaituna College in Berkeley, California, the first Muslim liberal arts college in America. He's on the board of advisors of the Religious Freedom Institute as well. So here's the opening question I'd like to pose to all three of our representatives of the monotheistic religions. 
As I mentioned earlier, there are deep divisions within our cultural and political landscape, and despair seems to be growing that we can ever, ever recapture a sense of the common good. In fact, there's even deep skepticism about whether we can approach and discern ultimate reality. It's fascinating that in 2016, the Oxford Dictionaries declared that its word of the year was the hyphenated phrase post-truth, which is often characterized by appeals to emotion and the advancement of one's own agenda through a methodical and crass repetition of assertions utterly disconnected to any honest objective, objective search for facts and truth. No side of the political spectrum is immune to following under the spell of this corrosive destroyer of civility and an honest quest for truth. Consensus seems increasingly difficult to achieve under these circumstances. One often hears today that everybody speaks their own truth as if there is no other truth that could be uh, found. Not surprisingly in such a cynical world, talk of right and wrong and pursuit of virtues can seem hopeless or hypocritical. That's the very reason that we are having this four-part webinar. It's the reason that we're going to follow up with this May 19th to 21st at the University of Chicago Divinity School, where the Religious Freedom Institute and the Martin Marty Center for the uh, Public Understanding of Religion is going to pursue for three days similar topics, whether we can recapture a public virtue that can be enabled by influence and uh, wisdom uh, from the monotheistic traditions. So the basic, the basic question I want to ask first is, is not the first step in making the case for the importance of virtues a bold affirmation that virtues must be rooted in truth, in some kind of transcendent and eminent reality which Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have often are always felt themselves to be witnesses of. Now, I'm not sure we have Rabbi Novak with us, do we? Has he arrived yet? Well, let me, let me pose the question to Professor Fennis then first. The question is, how can a faithful Christian make the case for the reality of objective truth in a world which talks about itself being post-truth? Professor Fennis. Thank you, Kent. Well, I, I spent quite a lot of time in our first conversation discussing that, and I won't repeat it all, but the essential point I tried to make was that everyone actually believes in truth, in the matters that concern them. They want to be in touch with reality. They want their systems to work. They know that systems like uh, computer systems work only because a lot of people have uh, discovered a lot of facts about the, the way the world works electronically and physically and chemically and, and so forth. And no one doubts that there's truth in, in that domain and that if you don't have the truth, you, you're going to fail. And uh, the, the key, I think, to relating that kind of truth, mathematical, hi historical, scientific, natural scientific truth, to transcendent truth is to realize that transcendence here initially is a matter of, so to speak, pressing on with questions, with pursuing questions of the very type that got you to discovering truth in the field that you're familiar with, whatever it is, natural science, history, whatever. Now, when I say pressing on, I mean searching for further explanation. The, the search for truth was always a search for explanation of what one started with, data of some sort or another, perceptions, experience, etc. give you a kind of given datum, and then you ask, what's the explanation of this? And you get natural science or historical explanation and so forth. And uh, God comes into the picture for uh, from a variety of directions without benefit of revelation for people who ask but how did all this get to be what it is 
intelligible, existing, and stable, and so forth. And uh, th that kind of pursuit of questions, honestly, as it were, relentlessly, uh, not being put off by claims that there's nothing to be found here, but looking for an explanation that really explains what one started with, which is, for example, the success of natural science. That kind of uh, relentless search can, and in many, many cases, does um, yield an understanding that there must be some sort of creator, there must be some sort of ultimate source of all this reality and intelligibility. And um, that's continuous with uh, the sort of theoretical pursuit is continuous with what you might call a more practical exercise of reason in which one's reflecting on the fact that there's goodness, there's a lot of goodness, that discovering truth is a good, that sharing truth with others is a good, that being sustained in one's own infancy and life by the help of others is a good, and so forth. And so one, again, reflectively can uh, arrive in principle at some sort of explanation that these goods hang together and there is such a thing as human flourishing and that what's flourishing for me is in principle flourishing for everyone and I've got reason to be interested in my flourishing but also in the flourishing of friends and neighbours and in the end of everyone who is like me, everyone who is human. So one gets uh, a, f a further, as it were, dimension of uh, transcendent truth, namely the goodness of the, let's call it, divine purpose in, let's call it, creating this universe intelligible and real. So that's what is traditionally called natural religion. Um, it's open to, in principle, everyone. And what the, the religions that you're talking about today um, add to that is a further dimension, which gets called uh, labeled revelation, divine revelation, where the search for information uh, was met, so to speak, on the way by the creator sharing information directly with us so that we're no longer inferring from data to explanation, but being given an explanation by communication from the creator to, well, in the first instance, prophets. And then through the prophets in one form or another, perhaps the ultimate prophet, uh, as of the communication from them to us, to those who are willing to accept uh, for reasons, for on grounds of evidence, that this prophet or these prophets have spoken truth. So that, that's, I think, the big picture, and I don't know whether you want me now to, to pursue it into the particular realm of, of virtue and virtues. I, yeah. I, I, think, I think that's good for now. Let me put uh, the question to Sheikh Hamza is slightly differently in light of your response. Uh, you began, Professor Fennis, by talking about the fact that even people who do not consider themselves believers need truth in their world, and often in terms of natural science, there seems to be less disagreement about the possibility of such truth existing. But when it comes to questions about what is proper behavior, what is right, what is wrong, um, Sheikh Hamza, do you think apart from somebody accepting the revelation of the Quran or the Bible, that there are ways that the monotheism is the ways that Islam can talk about right and wrong, the sort of the spiritual dimension, not natural science, but the spiritual dimension, which can say this is empirically verifiable that there are certain spiritual truths that are in fact at work here. I, I listened in on your discussion earlier. I wasn't able to participate in that one. And you, you talked about the truth of what can be observed about what happens if you break what we consider transcendent spiritual laws. 
Uh, could you say a little bit about how Islam views how it can make the case for the truth of, uh, of uh, reality out there and the truth of right and wrong or norms of right and wrong? You do need uh, a, uh, an authority outside of man uh, to, to, to make that case. And obviously that authority would be the creator of uh, men and women, uh, that the creator has that authority to tell us not you really shouldn't kill, but thou shalt not kill, um, which is very different uh, from, from uh, you ought not to kill. Uh, a command is very different from uh, a type of um, suggestion. She comes that we had a little trouble, at least I did, hearing everything you said at the beginning. So it seemed to be clearer at the end. But one thing that struck me was um, sometimes you wonder if the if Jews and Christians and Muslims are as skilled at apologetics and talking with the so-called nuns or the people who don't accept religion as they might be. I mean, if, for example, in the natural world, you can observe the truth of the falseness of a physical law with an experiment like walking to the 20th floor of a building and saying, I'm going to jump out the window. I don't believe in gravity. And you jump out the window and you get concrete evidence to the contrary. Well, in the spiritual realm, in our behavior, the way we treat each other, uh, those of us who are monotheists and make the case that in fact, the spiritual laws aren't just laws to see if we are willing to obey them or not, but they are designed for our flourishing. Then when you flout spiritual laws, when you treat people poorly, when you're unfaithful to your, your wife and you don't take care of your children, there are social consequences that any honest person can observe. And it's that kind of empirical evidence will sometimes then drive people to the conclusion that, well, maybe I would need uh, take seriously or think again about what religion says about right and wrong. But we have to be able to do that, talk that way, even before someone is able to accept what we might consider a relevatory source in, uh, in scripture or uh, the Quran. Um, but we often don't um, seem to make a persuasive case uh, that the, the the sense of morality that the monotheisms believe in uh, are observable uh, phenomena in the world that we all experience that can tell you something about whether they're true or not. Ismail, I want to th throw the ball to you to maybe ask the second question. So, um, Sheikh Hamza, I, I, you may have actually discussed this, but, but we we lost uh, part of your um, response to the to the um, you know uh, to the fir uh, first question that Kent asked, um, and then I'll ask Professor Finnis about um, you know about his view on this. But what do you um, what does Islam uh, believe and teach about the the nature of the virtuous life? In other words, um, what is a virtuous life? What does it consistent and what is it expected to achieve? What is the the purpose of it? Well, just uh, to quickly restate what I initially said, my point was that every generation has to grapple with nihilism, uh, that this, this has been ongoing uh, in human uh, civilizations and in e even in the Aboriginal peoples. You have to deal with, with, with the fact that you exist, uh, that, that uh, you have a life uh, what do you do with that life? Is that life meaningful? Is it purposeful? Um, I was saying that uh, the, the the Japanese philosopher Nishitani uh, Keiji wrote a book called The Self-Overcoming Nihilism. And in that book, he makes the argument that th this is a perennial problem, overcoming nihilism. And this is something that every religious tradition has to grapple with. And they make these truth claims. In terms of the virtuous life, I think one of the, the greatest testimonies to a virtuous life is the virtuous person, the good person. And, and, and I think a religion really can only be true uh, if it can produce that person. Uh, Christ said, by their fruits ye shall know them. That, that virtue, the proof is in the pudding, that, that virtue, a virtuous life, uh, a life well lived, uh, will have uh, consequences. Uh, you can see it on the faces of people. 
um, somebody, a uh, uh, 19th century uh, homeopathic physician said that by 50, everybody has the face they deserve. And there's a lot of truth to that. You can see goodness in people and, uh, and you can see people that should be uh, attractive by their features, but they're actually ugly because of their actions. And you can see people that should be unattractive by their features and yet they're quite beautiful uh, because of something that radiates from their souls. And so the other thing, what, uh, what uh, Dr. Hill was, was alluding to, I think is very true, that the, 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 the moral laws are like physical laws. They have consequences. So if you are sexually promiscuous, certain things are going to happen, not just the dissipation of, of, of your, your, your life's energy that's been given to you, I mean, even the Chinese are deeply aware of that, of the importance of kind of preserving life energy, but also the effects that it has in terms of just creating diseases, that uh, th these are pathogenic lifestyles, that they, they actually breed, uh, they're path pathogenic, they breed uh, uh, illnesses. And so uh, I think our religious traditions, my, my son asked me something about uh, 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 the other day, he asked me, you know, is Islam homophobic? Um, because he heard that from his friends at high school. And I told him, no, but it, it's, it's what it is, is it it's wants to preserve the health of people. And so certain behaviors uh, will be harmful. And this is something that uh, our, our doctors know about. They don't talk about it much anymore but they know the effects of certain lifestyles just on the health of people. And so the preservation of health is one of the obligations. It's one of the duties. In fact, uh, the Chinese, the Taoists say that you have a moral obligation to preserve your health because life doesn't start making sense until you get into your 60s and 70s. So it's very important to actually try to live as <laughs> long as possible so that you can actually begin to make sense of, of what you've been doing here. SubhanAllah. Sheikh Hamza, your, 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 your response reminded me of a, um, a saying of Uthman, the, uh, the third caliph and the, the companion of the Prophet, uh, where he uh, said to people, he said, um, I see the traces of uh, adultery on your faces. You know, you, you come upon me. And it, basically, you could just see that they had been, not actual adultery, but they had been, um, you know, looking at what they shouldn't have been looking at. And even this just appears on the face. And, and yeah, we say things like save face. And the Arabs have the, almost an identical term. They call it the water of the face, that, that you have to preserve the water of your face and that a, a dissipated life will actually exhaust that water. Yeah. And then that's the, the, the picture of Dorian Gray also is, uh, comes to mind. Right. Pro <laughs> Professor Finnis, um, what would you say about, uh, about that? Do you have any thing in response to what Sheikh Hamza said or, or could you tell us what, Christianity says about the nature and purpose of a virtuous life? Well, it's easy to talk about about virtue and um, very bad people can talk about virtue. The Nazis talked about virtue a lot and then in fact tried to inculcate virtue, especially in their most extreme elements like the SS, which was you know, constantly urged to live the life of a virtuous SS man. Mm. So the classical teaching of Plato and Aristotle and then of the prophets and, and the saints that uh, the, the virtues hang together uh, and that unless you, in a certain sense, you have them all, you don't have any of them. And that the master virtue is one of what I call practical reasonableness. They're in Greek phronesis and in Latin prudentia, but... Um, uh, let's say it's it's a matter of all round reasonableness, all round responsiveness to the, re the the true reasons there are for acting, and not trashing any of them, but holding them together in a in a reasonable way. And reasons are always about what's good, good for me, good for someone else, good for you, good for us all. So the the, the ideal of, of which is not simply a, a, an airy ideal, but the requirement of, of practical reasonableness, of all round integral practical reasonableness, is of responsiveness to the real reasons there are for acting and for respecting um, the basic human 
elements of flourishing and of promoting them. And so you have two kinds of, of moral norms which give the backbone to the general idea of virtue. You have moral norms or moral requirements about respecting life and health and uh, respecting truth, so avoiding killing and suicide uh, and avoiding lying are fundamental um, responsibilities that each of us has to respect truth. And since one of the basic human goods, um, one of the basic elements of human flourishing is marriage, um, respect for what's required for marriage, for that kind of commitment, a, a lifetime commitment to a procreative friendship, uh, that gives us, I think, the grounding of uh, sexual morality, which goes deeper than uh, uh, concern for health. So I think the the unhealthiness of the kind of lifestyle that uh, Sheikh Hamza was referring to goes much deeper than the causing physical illness. It cuts that person off from, from uh, a genuine marriage, but also... Making that kind of choice means uh, means rejecting uh, implicitly, w w willy nilly, whether you like it or not, uh, rejecting uh, the idea of marriage, in which sexual access uh, and enables the married couple, man and woman, to participate in what their commitment, their marriage. That's the core of, of sexual morality. Now, that's a good example, I think, of the relationship between nat what you might call natural reasonableness and revealed uh, teaching about morality. So the fundamental Christian idea about morality is that all its essential requirements, leaving aside requirements of, of um, a kind of higher sanctity, all its essential requirements are both revealed and natural. They're available to natural reason without revelation. And revelation through prophets and through Christ um, confirms and to some extent deepens, but mostly clarifies and makes more certain what was already available to, to reason and had been reached by great reasoners like Plato and Aristotle. So Plato's... It, just to take the example of sexual morality, since we got onto it, Plato's sexual morality is essentially identical to the morality of, of uh, let's say, Pope Paul VI. Um, to quote a, a, a book uh, on Plato and friendship, which was written by someone who regretted that Plato's morality uh, is like that of classic Christianity. Um, and, and that's that's not an accident. Um, that that is a little testimony in, its, in itself to the true relationship between revelation and reason. That reason, with many difficulties, with many ambushes and, and fallings by the wayside, can attain, and in great thinker like Plato does attain, where his culture was surrounded, surrounding him was, was missing it all the time, can attain truths which then are taught authoritatively by uh, and with divine authority, uh, pri primarily, I should say, in, in the teaching of Christ, which emphasizes not just the importance and greatness of marriage, but the importance and greatness of, of a pure intention. So the, the purity of the heart and the relationship between uh, action, the behavior, and the intention behind it is a kind of centerpiece of um, revealed teaching about virtue. Virtue then is given specificity in particular reasons for action and requirements of, of reasonableness. And, and I know we could actually talk about that for, there, there's so much that I wanted to, um, to, to elaborate on with you, but uh, let's ask, we now have, alhamdulillah, thank God, we now have uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Novak. And so I'd like to pose this question to you, uh, Rabbi. It was Novak. a challenge. It was a challenge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on, but, uh, yes. Yeah. We're, we're so glad that you stuck with it. And we're glad for our, um, our people behind the scenes who are we're working to get you back, get you in here. Um, so the question is, um, 
what is the virtuous life in the view of Judaism and what does it consist in and what is its purpose? What is its, its goal and its aim or aims? Well, uh, the, the virtuous life is, 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 is basically keeping the commandments of, of God as revealed in the Torah. Um, now, some of these commandments are uh, revealed to all people uh, uh, through what we would call natural law. Uh, that is a point that uh, Professor Finnis and I share in common, a commitment to natural law, although we have somewhat different views of what natural law, uh, uh, not, the, that, not to the norms of natural law, but to how it's uh, put together and uh, constituted and, and, and whatever. But for, for let's say here, uh, there, there's similarity there. But then, of course, there's the revealed Torah, uh, which is given to the people of Israel and anybody who wants to be a part of them. Uh, it's not racial. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, it is the keeping of the commandments of God. Now, uh, and uh, Professor Finnis spoke about intention. Intention is in Hebrew is called uh, kavana. Uh, and therefore, a person who keeps the commandments of God with a understanding of what one surmises or has been taught or were God's purposes in commanding these uh, or so that one's intention is in sync with uh, with, with the, the intention of God as, 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 as a divine lawgiver, uh, then virtue might be considered to be cultivating uh, the proper uh, intention. Now, when it comes to negative commandments of thou shalt not, uh, you don't really have to have proper intention not to, to, to murder or not to uh, steal or, 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 or whatever. Uh, you uh, simply uh, indicate, you, you might understand why it's uh, pro prohibited, uh, but your intention there is not that important. Your intention is important when you're doing positive commandments, like love thy neighbor as thyself. Love thy neighbor as thyself means uh, not just a feeling, uh, it means acting in a loving way towards uh, a, a, your neighbor. There's a very good book by a close friend and colleague of mine, a great uh, Catholic biblical scholar, uh, Gary Anderson of Notre Dame, uh, who uh, shows that in the Hebrew Bible, uh, this is not just commanding an emotion. Kant says, for example, how can you command an emotion? Uh, but clearly in order to love your neighbor properly, uh, you have to cultivate an inner attitude, uh, and uh, the rabbis say that the reason you love your neighbor is your neighbor is created in the image of God. God obviously loves your neighbor, and you're imitating God by loving your, your, your neighbor and acting in, a, in, in, in tangible ways. But the intention is uh, uh, very um, uh, important there. Uh, so one could consider that the virtue is really cultivating the proper inner attitude uh, which requires that one contemplate what God's reasons were in, some, in, 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 in the commandments. And the commandments uh, uh, that are considered to be uh, re involving the relationship with fellow human beings uh, is uh, that God wants us to be living in a, in a just and peaceful world uh, and therefore proper interactions, not just avoiding violence, but actually being concerned for our, 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 our neighbors as, as they are meant to be concerned for us. Uh, when it comes to the, uh, what's called Ben Adam Lacom, the, the relationship with God, uh, then this is to cultivate uh, a relationship uh, uh, with, with God. So then the Jewish tradition, when, when is, is, keeping the Sabbath, for example, God in a way is keeping the Sabbath with us. It's, 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 it's a form of, of, of communion uh, with God. It's not just God saying you should do this and, and whatever, but it's, it's, like a, it's like a good parent telling a child to do something and said, I'll, I'll participate, I'll, 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 I'll show you how to do it. Uh, so that it's not something that is just being directed to somebody else by heteronymously, as we would say, you know, from an external source. But it's, yes, God is external, but God is, allowing us to participate in God's life and God participates in, in our life. So that is uh, what it is. And, and, and unfortunately, many people have characterized Judaism as legalism. You know, Kant said that 
uh, Jews is not really a religion, it's just kind of a, a legal code. And unfortunately, certain Jewish philosophers went along with that. Uh, but actually, the cultivation of, of a proper inner intention, uh, which is not just cognitive, it's also emotive. I mean, it's also uh, that one uh, feels uh, sympathy, you know, feeling with uh, uh, God, the, the the divine lawgiver and judge, and uh, and the, and and the one who elects the the community where where, where this is uh, becomes concrete. So uh, that is the question, and it's not a question of how many commandments you've kept. So you keep a tally. I kept nine today, and you only kept seven. So therefore, I'm better than you are. Uh, it all depends upon how you kept them and why you kept them uh and whatever and and in terms of divine judgment uh god keeps in our tradition teaches that god keeps very different uh set of records than we do it's not something that uh, like money in the bank or 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 uh, whatever so Judaism and to a certain extent, Catholicism too have been characterized as you know legalism and uh, whatever. But the, the point is is that people are still told to keep the commandments even if they have the wrong attitude. They shouldn't wait for the attitude. Keeping the as the Talmud says, if you keep the commandments of the Torah even for extraneous reasons uh, or whatever, uh, keep them and everything because eventually. Uh, if you become habituated in keeping the commandments, you'll start keeping them for the right reason. Uh, so it's it's doing things for the right reason or cultivating the right reasons, the right intentions, uh, both cognitive and emotive, that uh, where things like virtue theory are uh, important uh, in terms of uh, inwardness. Keeping the commandments is outward. It means outward action. But there has been an inwardness that is uh both directing it and uh ahead and and motivating it uh in one's uh, heart before i pass it over to kent i just wanted to reflect that um your um your discussion here and um those of our other two guests reminds me of the connection between de deontological ethics or following commands and virtue ethics which is the inner disposition and so there's a really fascinating interaction between these two. And we, you know, um, really hope to explore that more at our University of Chicago um, uh, symposium. Um, and maybe we'll get some um, more opportunity to do that here. But I, I know that your um, student, um, uh, Alexander Green, I think has an entire book. Uh, really, yes. Yeah, yeah, focusing on this. Alexander Green wrote his dissertation with uh, me at the University of Toronto yeah. on the theory of uh, Levi ben Gershon. Gershon is a, a 13, uh, 14th century uh, Jewish thinker who incorporated a great deal of virtue theory in a basically a law-based uh, tradition. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I, I encouraged him to do, and he did, and he published it as a book, is that he deal with virtue theory of such people as uh, Alistair McIntyre and Martha Nussbaum and, and, and others that have from very different perspectives of mm -hmm. virtue theory and show that these, this, these 14th century discussions are not just a period piece, but can be entered in to enrich discussions of, uh, of, uh, of the importance of virtues. Absolutely. Kent, would you like to pick it up with our next question? So um, before I get to an issue that I think is really critical, which I call the, the kind of the question of the moral gap, before I get to that, though, I, I want to just make this observation. The whole reason we are doing this is to investigate whether in a pluralistic society where the number of people who identify as non-believers or nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, as opposed to N-U-N-S, uh, where that group is growing, and particularly among the intellectual elites, and then you have the residue of religion, including the three monotheisms where, uh, you know, represented here today, the question we're asking ourselves, the question is, how does a pluralistic society in the West, in Canada, the United States, in Europe, where you have all of these mixtures of people who see life, apparently see life so differently, how do they interact with each other? 
uh, one of the things that has come up in the previous three webinars is the theological reason that Jews and Christians and Muslims believe that they can work with the non-believers in pursuing the common good is they have a theological presupposition that God created the world in such a way that whether somebody acknowledges God or not, if they're honest, they can access their conscious or what we might call natural law, but they, they have an innate sense of right and wrong, which is there, which we believe is a, a gift from God. And it's more of a question of honesty than anything else as to whether they try to access it. So on the basis of that, Jews and Christians and Muslims believe they can work with non-believers, let alone with other believers who are monotheists. And that's a, that's a key point that sometimes I think we need to make sure we make to the non-believers so they know that we consider it possible to work with them and uh, want to make the case that uh, we think it's in their best interest and society's best interest for them to continue to work with us as we pursue together in this uh, confusing world uh, the good that will help our children. And that's I think that's a really important point. But there's another issue that that interests me. And I, I called it earlier the moral gap issue. Now, some say, and I must put myself in this category, when I was in college after being raised in a religious background, I decided I don't really need the church. I don't need Christianity. Anybody can pursue the good and the beautiful and um, want to be kind, et cetera. You don't need religion to do that. In fact, religion fails so often, I just do not have anything to do with it. So I embarked for several years on a kind of experiment to see if I could live the good life without any reference to God or the transcendent. Uh, why couldn't I do that just fine? Well, it took me a while to work through that, but my own personal experience me led me to believe I was a little naive in that assumption, that something that was missing that would have enabled me perhaps to do a better job. Now, let me give you an example of this. Mark Twain one time said, it's not the parts of the Bible that I, that I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do. And what he was referring to, of course, was his sense that there are things the Bible talks about that he thought were true, but he couldn't live up to them. And he, he just simply recognized that. Or a, a more painful example from American history is Thomas Jefferson, who penned the wonderful lines in the Declaration of Independence about all men being created equal and having the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and making all sorts of statements throughout his life opposing the expansion of slavery, at least, and even the institution of slavery, at one point even saying that he trembled for his country if it continued down the path it was on. And yet Thomas Jefferson kept slaves until the end of his life, even brought slaves into the White House. This moral gap, this was the theory I had when I worked for the John Templeton Foundation and uh, I really wanted to pursue was this moral gap between human beings seeing clearly what they should be, what they should do, how they should live a virtuous life and their inability to live it out raises this profound question. Is one of the ways that Jews and Christians and Muslims can contribute to our society today in all its turmoil, is to suggest that in pursuit of the common good, in pursuit of the, the uh, virtuous life, we believe that the help of God, the help of religious institutions is absolutely critical to get further down that road towards living the virtuous life than if we think we just try to do it on our own. As, as I put it, I, I used to be in the Rotary Club, but the difference between the Rotary Club and the church or the mosque is that the Rotary Club has good intentions and they just try to carry them out. The people who are in the church or the mosque or the synagogue know they are in need of God if they are to have any possibility of living in accord with their highest values. Uh, maybe she comes, uh, I'll throw the question to you first. What do you think about this proposition that you can try to live the virtuous life, but you're going to have a whole lot more success if you realize where those values came from, come from, and you seek the help of religion to, we talk about forgiveness or empowerment, but to get the job done. 
this is obviously uh, Bismillah. This is obviously a distinction between, uh, I think, Christianity and Judaism and Islam. Is Christianity addresses this quite clearly with with uh, the failure of human beings to live up to uh, these laws that they've been commanded to follow. Um, I think in in the Islamic tradition. Um, we actually believe in, in a type of perfectibility of soul and that, that life is, if somebody is committed to uh, this tradition, that over time uh, they move in, into a more rarefied state uh, by purifying their intentions, by working on themselves through virtuous practice. And, and we have two paths for this. One is the path of salvation, which is, is open to everybody. And then the path of uh, sanctification, which is something that uh, the Quran calls them the sabiqun, the outstrippers, the people that aren't satisfied with that. I think there's a there's a uh, a story in the, in the Gospel of Matthew that indicates this about the the wealthy man, the well-to-do man who comes to Jesus and asks him uh, how how he can get salvation. He says, "Follow the commandments," and he says, "I I do," and then he says, "Oh." then give all your goods away and come follow me. That's the distinction between the two paths. One is the path of salvation, but the other is the path of sanctification, which is a much harder path. And, and the saints are what we call the awliya. Mm -hmm. Saints are the people that embody this. And when they're, when they're present in society, people see them as ideals and exemplars and then imitate them. But the idea that human beings don't live up to their highest ideals, I mean, this is the human condition, and this is why we have toba or teshuva or metanoia. I mean, we have, uh, God has given us in these traditions ways of rectifying that. And through, through uh, turning to God and rectifying that with God, and, and God promises to... Uh, to forgive us, and then also attempting to redress our wrongs in society. Uh, in, in the Islamic tradition, there's there's three conditions for for uh, repentance, but there's a fourth condition if the sin involved another person, and that is to redress that wrong. And if you're unable to do it, to pray for that person. If you stole money to give charity in, in the name of that person, they might not even know their name, but God knows who they were. So that that is... That's the human condition of constantly working on the self. And people that are committed to this path uh, will, will be struggling with their selves. The Quran gives us uh, three stages, the, the commanding self, the nafs al-amara, the nafs al the, uh, the blaming self, which is the self that's struggling within itself. And then finally, the nafs al-mutma'inna, which is the self at peace, the soul at peace, that's finally found peace because... It's come to complete submission uh, with its creator. And so this, these are the stages, and there's a path to get to there. So we actually believe that people can uh, achieve a perfectibility, a human perfectibility of the soul, what's called an insan al kamil. And, and the exemplar for us, obviously, is the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, and then the saints in our tradition who know and embody that. Mm -hmm. Kent, Kent, before we before you th uh, bring the, throw that question over to our other guests, um, Sheikh Hamza, I wanted to ask: is, is there also though a sense in Islam in which um, that um, that uh, uh, spiritual um, uh, striving uh, that success is nevertheless still um, uh, only uh, with Allah's help, God's help? So, for example, the 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 prayer that the Prophet used to make, do not leave me to myself, uh, even for the blinking of an eye. In other words, um, you know, uh, that that it's not uh, in our own, uh, I mean, th there's, a, there's almost a balance between, and maybe you could just mention that balance between our own striving, our own struggling, but also that um, if, if God was not helping us with that, then we would never have any success. Do I ha have that correct or, or not? That's absolutely correct, and that's what the one calls tofiq, which is that supernatural element in the effort. And this is why I mentioned this earlier in, in, in uh, the previous conversation that you know, the single most successful uh, addiction program is 12 step because they, they, they're forced to recognize something, a power greater than themselves. 
and and this is something that religion offers that I don't think any secular uh, tradition uh, can do. And it's one of the great blessings of uh, of religious tradition is that that it is a, an allowing for uh, something supernatural mm -hmm. to enter into the soul. Uh, what uh, Christianity would call grace, we call baraka, you know, look for law. I mean, there's different words for this. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rabbi Novak, uh, how would you respond uh, in terms of, of how the Jewish tradition um, deals with the need of God to live out the virtuous life that we're called to live out? Well, uh, I, I would phrase the question differently. I, I think that uh, the notion that uh, religion, that the, the, the relationship with God, the covenantal relationship, uh, requires a moral justification uh, is uh, already kind of a, a me tooism. Uh, the fact is that what Jews and Christians and Muslims, mutatis mutandis, in certain different ways, but the same way, is that they enter into what we call civil society committed to a law which is not of their own making and therefore not of their unmaking. So therefore, for example, there's a medieval uh, uh, Jewish text that asks the question, um, can Jews enter into uh, relationships, com commercial relationships, with, 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 it happened to be Christians, but it could be Muslims as well, um, uh, that require one to take an oath? And the answer is yes, because they are committed, it is the same God, and they are committed to living under what they perceive as the law of, uh, of God. And therefore, if they violate their oath, there's something that we can hold them up to. Uh, so in that way, we come into relation with people from other traditions or people who claim to be no tradition. I, th I think everybody comes from a tradition Alistair McIntyre once said that religion is uh, that liberalism is 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 the only tradition that doesn't want to call itself a tradition, uh, but uh, but it becomes there that it's not so much uh, that I attempt to, to give some kind of secular moral justification of my religious uh, commitments, but rather it's my religious commitments that allow me to enter into relations with other people in secular space, uh, which just means that it is under the uh, aegis of, of no particular uh, uh, tradition or revelation, uh, in good faith, uh, and that if I violate my agreements, I there, there's something they hold me up to. Uh, so that is the case. It, it, it was the the quintessential modern Jewish heretic, Baruch Spinoza, who basically inverted that and said that, therefore, religion has to justify itself by the secular morality of, of, of the state, when actually the previous notion was that uh, it, was the, it, it, was, it was the opposite. Uh, it was that my entrance into relations with other people has to be consistent with and even authorized by mm -hmm. uh, my commitment to, 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 to the covenant, which mm -hmm. is the, the, the relationship with, uh, with God, not my, as, as an individual, it's an individual that I participate, it's, it's, it's God's relationship with, with his people. You know, we, we talk a lot these days about identity pro uh, politics and the fact that in our societal discord, in our polarization, that people cannot escape the tribe, the gender, the sexual orientation, whatever it is that they believe defines them. They cannot escape that. And because of that, we can't find any common consensus. And yet, if you were to take seriously what's been said the last hour from the three monotheisms, that if we're created in the image of God and we have the obligation to treat each other as created in the image of God, uh, that all have human dignity, if you believe that you're obligated to accord all human dignity, 
you simply can't allow your identity to trump that. It strikes me as one of the most powerful gifts of monotheism to a society that's tending towards tribal politics is that saying, no, there's an outside command that says we have to treat even our enemies and those who are different than us with a certain civility and decorum and dignity. And uh, Professor Finnis, we talked here today as if, you know, there's a Jewish position on this and a, and a Christian position, a Muslim position. Of course, all of us know that our traditions are all diverse within themselves. And so like on this question about what does Christianity believe about what uh, the, the necessity of the church or of God in helping us live the virtuous life, there's, there is great tension and disagreement and variety of views there. There are some Christians who don't think there's any help that we can get that can allow us to make much moral progress, if any, in this life. And there are other traditions that a little bit more like uh, Sheikh Hamza's understanding in the Islamic tradition, which says, no, with God's help, there is some progress that is possible. But Professor Finnis, in terms of the basic question of do we dare take on trying to live the virtuous life without a prayer to God for help? What would you say to that? Well, uh, can, that's continuous with your your problematic about the gap and um, what, what's been said about the gap and responses to it is all fine but I, I think that's all very far distant from the original problematic uh, which was a, how do we confront um, how do we respond to the fact of radical pluralism uh, in our societies and what kind of as it were response a, a great religious tradition can make to that radical pluralism. Uh, your problem about the gap is a kind of old fashioned one where everyone basically shares the same ideas about morality and the problem is how to live up to it. But now we're confronted with a situation in which that's, that's clearly dissipated in the societies that we, that we live in. And in my view, the, the essential, um, the essential uh, attitude for people like us to take is that we can, uh, by going back to the roots of what we believe is the source of, of revelation uh, and the tradition that communicates most authentically that revelation in its most authentic form, by going back to that we can get clarity and certainty about issues that then have to be discussed with people who haven't gone back and some, in some sense are at the moment blocked from going back to those sources. And we can do so because we can discuss with them on the basis of natural reason, natural law, if you like, uh, but we don't have to use those terms, uh, on the basis of uh, a reasonable understanding of the human situation, predicament, nature, flourishing, etc. We can discuss the problems that confront us all, big problems of, of global society and little problems of whether it's right for me or my ch children to relate sexually or otherwise to someone else. Um, and all the problems, commercial and uh, in terms of uh, commitments and contracts and negligence and so forth that uh, arise in everyone's life we can discuss all of those without referring to our religious tradition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, by being reasonable in a way that we know our tradition has authenticated and in a certain sense guaranteed, but we don't have to discuss the authentication or the guarantee. Mm -hmm. What we have to discuss the help that we can get from the spiritual resources of the church and its sacraments or whatever else uh, corresponds to that in another re religious tradition. We, none of that is necessary or even I think desirable uh, for conversation in the public square. Our discourse in the public square is constantly in danger of being simply trashed and marginalized by being identified as religious. And once a, uh, a view, a, a piece of discourse is, is labeled religious, it's, it's in a way blocked off from participation in the, dis in the discourse. 
So we have to, as I say, in our own resources, draw on our tradition and then go out into a public conversation where th that is, those resources are not part of the evidence. Now, um, you, you said I, I taught for 45 years, um, and then you said Notre Dame, well, no, 25 years at Notre Dame, but 45 years in Oxford, I taught law and the philosophy of law and the foundations of ethics and the foundations of morality. And I never once referred to uh, Catholicism or the sources of Christian revelation, and I didn't need to. I was drawing on that for my uh, full clarity and full certainty, but I didn't need to appeal to it, and none of us needs to appeal to the corresponding um, source of certainty or clarity. Yeah. We can get out there. We've got good reasons. Right. Um, they were good for Plato. They were good for Aristotle. They were good for the saints and the prophets, and they're good for us. And the fact that those reasons are, as it were, losing their traction in wide parts of society is a is an important fact. Um, that's happened again and again in our civilization, and civilizations have risen and fallen and collapsed and, and disintegrated uh, around the, this kind of mistake and error, and you just soldier on. You keep on giving the good reasons, giving the arguments for them, and letting the other issues, so to speak, we're not, none of us is in charge of, of the way the world will work out. Uh, we just have to do our bit uh, as well as we can. Right. right. It, it's interesting. Uh, one of the questions that we have not posed, but you have just answered, uh, was how do we respond to those who are fearful that as a Jew or as a Muslim or as a Christian, we in that world hold views about what is true and false and even what uh, whether a person is going to be saved or not. The conclusion that many people draw from uh, uh, somebody being an adherent to those, to a religion which holds certain things as true and false, is that they surely can't participate um, civilly in the um, in the public square. And your answer that you've just provided makes it absolutely clear why that's just the wrong conclusion. Uh, that religious people uh, are quite able to function and work well with non-religious people. And uh, because of the common language of natural reason or conscience or whatever one chooses to call it to deal with that, it reminds me of the phrase G.K. Chesterton used. I, I can't remember if it was in Orthodoxy or, or the Eternal Man when he talked about Orthodoxy as he understood it in Christianity simply fit the lock of reality. I mean, Christians and Muslims and Jews, I presume, believe that what they believe about God and about their nature of life fits the lock of all reality, the reality of the societies in which they live and to the degree they can be faithful to it, uh, they can make a contribution to uh, uh, doing what they perceive to be God's will. Kent, I, I, um, uh, I wanted to push back a little against what um, you were saying, and I certainly don't presume to push back against Dr. Finnis, but I did want to inquire a little bit and then get some um, response from our other two guests. Um, so when it comes to the issue of whether or not we should be, uh, whether it's wise or whether it's, um, let's say, um, uh, you know, even permissible uh, to um, provide religious uh, reasons for our, um, you know, for our um, arguments for the common good in society. Um, isn't it? Isn't there a sense in which um, uh, perhaps uh, everyone is not on the, as much on the same page as we would hope that they are? So, for example, with um, you know, with the of, of course, as Sheikh Hamza mentioned, this is a uh, an age-old problem. But you have certain people who um, deny the very existence of of truth, as much as you mentioned that we're all we all kind of acknowledge that uh, truth is a good and something to be sought. Um, we would hope so, but also at the same time, there, there, there is, there are um, intellectual trends or ideological trends that actually reject um, the notion of 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 truth altogether. So um, there's that, and then there's the, uh, then there's the idea that as well that um, uh, what our what the founding fathers of, of the United States said, which is essentially that a um, a republican government that has institutions 
that do not um, uh, that do not formally declare an established religion cannot uh, persist if the um, uh, if religious uh, uh, the premises that come along with religion, uh, for example, of a day of judgment, of um, of uh, a fear of God and and so on um, are lost. In other words, um, that the liberal um, that a liberal a government with liberal or rep whatever word we want to use republican institutions um, uh, cannot um, uh, cannot provide does not provide its own um, uh, um, does not provide any moral substance. And so, when we lack a moral substance, a substance uh, um, the teachings of virtue, when we lack the fear of God and and so on, that that um, uh, that uh, polity is going to necessarily uh, collapse. And so I wonder if in seeding the ground and say, okay, well, let's just merely talk about policies and uh, what, you know, or, or not, I don't wanna just keep this in the realm of government actions because we also uh, see politics as something in a, in a Aristotelian sense as something much broader. But if we were, if we were to remove all talk of the transcendent, all talk of the moral um, from our uh, our public discourse. Um, then, and we and we decide to to argue only on the basis of what's like empirical uh, studies or so on. Are, aren't we going to um, uh, facilitate that that moral collapse that was feared? And I did want to ask Dr. Finnis, but um, could we? I'd like to ask Sheikh Hamza and Rabbi Novak, and then because. Dr. Finnis, this question is really in response to what you said. Um, I'd like to hear your, your response as well. As I said, I, I taught for 45 years in Oxford. And in Oxford, you teach, uh, if you're a sort of regular college teacher, you teach in one-to-one -one or two-to-one tutorial. So you've got uh, a young person, 20-something years old, um, very smart, um, a, a, for an hour, an hour and a half, uh, and... Uh, no one else is listening, nothing is recorded, uh, and you can discuss what you like. And a number of times during those conversations on foundations of legal philosophy, um, the question of whether there's truth um, will we'll come up with a bright young skeptic. And you have to grapple with it, and you can, because uh, if, if he or she is willing to say anything, then you can soon show, as Aristotle showed in Book 4 of the Metaphysics, and philosophers have been showing again and again, you, you can show that they do in fact uh, adhere to an idea of truth. Uh, there are mistakes, there are errors, there are invalid arguments, uh, and the claim that there are no truths is itself a claim to be true. Uh, if it's not claiming to be true, uh, then why take any notice of it? So you can dialectically move someone to understand what they already, in fact, well understand, namely that there is truth and there is error. And then you can move on from there to, to discuss uh, the goodness of truth and the idea that there are true goods and uh, true harms and so forth. Now, at, to skip to the end, uh, at the end of of all the three substantial books that I wrote on the foundations, I get to the question of God. I, in each of the uh, the main two books, I actually carry on the discussion and, and show that it's not just a question, but there's an answer, to, a better answer, a rational answer to the question, and that's that God does exist and did create and is creating and is sustaining everything. Now, then I say uh, and said, um, and it's a question of fact, whether this creator has communicated with us. And there I leave it. So the whole great question of uh, revealed religion and its institutions uh, is, is left. But uh, I've tried to show to anyone who was willing to follow the argument that if you follow an argument that just starts with, as it were, nothing shared except that uh, you get to a position that requires further investigation. Is there a revelation? And if there is, hadn't I better line up with it? Um, so I can't, uh, as it were, single-handedly, and nobody can single-handedly, or even as a small group or as a big group, solve the civilizational question whether a polity can survive without uh, a, a sort of shared religion. That's a, a historical experiment. The answer hasn't yet come. It's too early. 
uh, there are reasons to think it, it, it's unlikely to survive, but that's not an issue really for anyone. Everyone must stick to his or her last and do it well. And if you do intellectually, you'll get to affirming uh, what could be shared and then could perhaps sustain a society. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, Rabbi Novak, uh, before we get to Sheikh Hamza, I, I wanted to um, ask you to elaborate on that. Uh, what is the, um, you know, what kind of position does um, our pluralism of our polity put us in um, where we uh, are somehow as religious people caught between this situation of where we have uh, 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 we live in we live in a, in a political order that does not have an established religion, but at the same time, the founders of the United States saw themselves. They didn't see themselves as establishing something that was outside the context of, you know, divine law. I mean, they what they saw themselves as doing was um, essentially they saw the Declaration of Independence. They saw the Constitution as essentially um, manifestations of or instantiations of natural law. That is God's. Um, God's God's law. They didn't see themselves as establishing an order that was outside of you know in the, in the way that the French Revolution uh, French Revolution um, uh, uh, very consciously understood themselves as rebelling against um, the the very notion of a divine order. Um, you know, and we know that from the um, uh, you know from the from the works of even Jefferson, who is alleged to have been by some people a deist and so on, but in reality, um, you know, uh, saw himself as um, uh, elaborating uh, in a, a political order and establishing a political order that was founded in uh, the divine, uh, as part of the divine order. So how do we, as religious people today in 2021, at a time where many, many people reject that, um, you know, how do we, how do we uh, uh, live? I mean, how do we, how do we live in a, in a, in a society where positive law is not seen as uh, necessarily related to Divine law um, is not is not seen as having any necessary reference to that at all. Whereas we, if you know, as believers, um, we would re I would presume we would re reject that. Even Muslims, Christians, and Jews uh, reject that. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the the question there is that people assume, and Professor Finn spoke about you know, if you have a religious point of view, people are suspect. Uh, suspicious of you, uh, if they don't have that point of view or a different point of view, uh, is that at least in, in, in Jewish tradition, our morality is not deduced from our theology. There are certain moral norms that are uh, clearly understood by all reasonable people. What our theology does is basically informs our morality gives it a, a cosmic context, uh, which is something that we bring. So we, we say to, to people in discussing some of these moral issues that I'm not, you don't have to accept my theological uh, uh, presuppositions. I don't deduce my morality for them. I think that they offer better ultimate explanations uh, of why um, being uh, morally reasonable uh, is a part of a larger order than just, uh, you know, good relations. Uh, that is the case, but one doesn't require that. Now, interestingly enough, I, there, there was a time when we, when we, we religious people who held this basically natural law view, uh, could talk with people who didn't have a, a commitment, uh, to, uh, uh, to that. But the problem now is that we're dealing with people who are not liberals in the classical sense. There's they're people who've bought into ideologies where they literally they deduce their morality and the ideologies are frequently what we would call idolatries. Um, G.K. Chesterton, uh, whether he said it or not, but he could have said it, uh, is that people who begin believing in nothing wind up believing in anything. And therefore, you have people who come who have notions of gender and, and, and I mean, that are that are absolutely uh, totally irrational uh, and deduce their morality from that. And then you have uh, a, 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 a problem. Uh, 
I, uh, fortunately, in our university, we have people who are of a secular mind, but who are, are Kantians. Well, Kant believed in, in, in objective moral order. He even had a, a, a metaphysics, believe it or not, uh, and whatever. It's not, it's not mine, but I can have very uh, consistent discussions uh, with these people. Uh, we, we, we might agree, disagree, but basically there, there is a notion of, of, of moral reasonableness uh, precisely because they don't, I mean, Kant himself said, he said, when, when, when I'm constructing this whole system, I'm just trying to give a better explanation of what people normally accept. But the, the reason we don't have a common morality now is not because it's religious people dealing with skeptics. Uh, it's uh, people dealing with a, a, a religion that has uh, a track record uh, that talks about God as that which nothing greater can be conceived. Uh, and people who are operating on ideologies and uh, uh, of uh, worship of the earth and uh, uh, and certain forms of radical environmentalism and uh, whatever that that are just at odds with what we consider to be reasonable, uh, and they deduce their morality uh, from that. One, one, one said about. Uh, a certain person whom, a certain philosopher whom Professor Finnis has debated with, I won't mention her name, uh, is that she's in favor of every God except the Lord God of Israel. Uh, and uh, so uh, that is, uh, I, I mean, the fact that the, the notion that we're religious people and we have these, these, you know, irrational beliefs, which are not irrational, they're not verifiable, but they're not irrational, uh, 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 in that sense, that they're that they're uh, out of sync with uh, normal experience, uh, uh, and that uh, that we're coming in with all kinds of baggage that can be eliminated by uh, Occam's razor, is we're now dealing with people who are coming with a, a metaphysics that uh, is. First of all, not a, a, a worship of, a, a, of that which another greater can be conceived, which is the definition of the name God, uh, but uh, you know uh, the type of people that that one man can call uh, 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 another man uh, his husband, or one woman can call another woman her wife, and everything, which is just contrary to uh, the use of of, of, of language. Uh, or the, the type of people who who can, who, who can say that uh, an unborn uh, child, a fetus, uh, has no rights whatsoever. It can be uh, discarded as if it were, uh, you know, uh, uh, a callus on your foot, uh, which is just contra. I mean, there the science is on the side of the religious people, but it can be uh, the rational argument can be made. Uh, one want one of people when I mean it, it becomes the question that is that what the answer is is that our theology, which is a way of doing metaphysics actually, I think it's the only way you can do metaphysics these days, uh, basically it shows us that our rational morality is not a rational island in an otherwise absurd universe. This is a very fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And I, um, you know, I was hoping that we would, in this conversation, find a lot of common ground between the three of us. And not only have we done that, but we've also drawn out some really interesting um, uh, sort of different perspectives that, um, you know, we really need, I think, a, a long, long time to explore. And Sheikh Hamza, I am really uh, looking forward to hearing what is your thought on this um, this discussion here? Well, uh, uh, Bismillah, I, I want to say that uh, I think uh, Dr. Finnis made some important points about working with people. Um, and I think our, our religion encourages us to do that. Um, but I do feel that, you know, our religions have a lot to say about things like economics. Uh, I think all three of our religions agree on the problem of usury, which is a major uh, problem uh, in, in the world. And certainly uh, the exploitative nature of, uh, of the type of financial uh, instruments that are used to really harm people. And we just saw with the uh, the Game Boy situation uh, where they shut people down for getting in on the game that were just uh, common people. And, and the Quran warns about 
uh, my being in, in a small elite. Uh, it's also one of the reasons, uh, according to Aristotle in Book 5 on revolutions, uh, he said one out of the 11 reasons for revolutions, uh, the, the number one reason was when the 99 get fed up with the 1%. So if we don't have more equity, and I think our religions really drive that uh, importance uh, home. I, I, it amazes me, the Catholic encyclicals about usury that were written in the 19th century are very interesting. Um, also, the encyclical about socialism is very interesting. Uh, why our religions wouldn't uh, support uh, a lot of the ideas. But I would say uh, a lot of people now, I don't think it's possible to work with them because they've gone mad. And, and societies do go mad. Uh, I think uh, Germany went mad, uh, France went mad. Many countries do go mad. And it takes time for them to kind of regain a type of sanity uh, which is senators, right? It's, uh, it's really health. So I think our religions have a lot to say, a lot to offer. And I also think it's important that we not forget that the vast majority of people are not in academia. I think academia has had a terrible impact on a lot of young people by teaching things. I mean, certainly not these uh, prestigious scholars uh, here, Dr. Finnis and Dr. Novak, but I think they know that within academia, there are some really, really dangerous ideas uh, that these people don't take responsibility for in the way that, you know, and Dostoevsky deals with this with Ivan and Shmerdikov, that, that ideas have consequences. And so, people, you know, these teachers should be so shocked when they see their students canceling them uh, and turning on it because it's their ideas that have produced this generation. Um, so I think in a lot of ways uh, we have to uh, be witnesses. The Quran calls us to be witnesses uh, to, and, and, and not to shy away from, from our faith and that, that, uh, that actions have consequences. And if, if we're not aligned with the heaven, which was in every civilization uh, in human history, there's been some understanding of that vertical alignment. And I think uh, to, to, to just reduce everything to a kind of horizontal plane, I, I, I think it's just gonna create uh, more and more havoc. So, uh, on the, and also just another thing that I think is really important is that we have our individual micro world, and this is where religion is most effective for us as individuals. In terms of society and the common good and the common wheel, I think our religions do have a lot to say about it. but. People need to, to navigate their own lives. And this is where I think it's extremely important for us not to shy away from asserting our faith and that, that faith-based lives are uh, richer lives. They're healthier lives, even physically healthier lives, but they're certainly spiritually healthier. The soul uh, needs that sustenance. Man cannot live on bread alone. And that, and that is as true uh, today as when it was stated. So I think that we have a moral obligation uh, and, 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 and a, a, a religious obligation to offer um, the truths that our faiths have to others that uh, are, are, might not even know about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, Hamza, thank you so much, Sheikh Hamza, for that. I, I think I will uh, try to draw this to a close now. We, we had begun in part um, to explore the question of the role of religion and the monotheisms and making a contribution to public discourse about the nature of the good and how to pursue the good together. In these last few minutes with uh, Sheikh Hamza speaking, it reminds me that uh, we don't just need religious people as part of the, uh, the discussion, we need historians. And uh, our era has been described often as one of uh, mm -hmm. where historical amnesia has been uh, present and that's been very, very dangerous because anybody you don't have to be a genius to, to uh, read history and to follow the consequences of certain ideas. We've done this a lot after the, uh, the period of, of the Nazis and the ideas that led to that. We've done it with respect to the Rwanda genocide that resulted in uh, millions dying. And we can see exactly what the wording and the statements and the forces were that led to it. Any intelligent person who pays attention to history and observes natural reason and the result of it 
we'll learn some things. And all of that can be of great help to us. Uh, let me say this in closing. Uh, really tremendously grateful uh, to our three panelists today, Rabbi Novak and Professor Fennis and uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, uh, to have the three of you together and individually before this has been a, a veritable intellectual and religious feast. And we thank, we can't thank you enough. And I also want to thank uh, those who um, are seeing this live and uh, those who will see it later. Uh, there's been tremendous interest in this. We've gotten a lot of comments that people are hungry for discourse on this topic, uh, uh, hungry for a way to find a way to think about the common good and virtue that transcends uh, identity politics and the polarizing impact of, of some of, of that which is upon us. And then I just will say also in conclusion that I think all of you who are interested in this discussion are going to want to follow very closely what happens at the University of Chicago Divinity School, May 19th to 21st. We have um, 24 scholars, eight from each of the monotheisms, eight of the best scholars in the tradition who will be together for the better part of two full days and one evening, uh, virtually or in person there to discuss the the way their religions understand virtue, and most importantly, the way the living out of those virtues would have a positive impact on our on our societies. And so, some of that may be available, may be available online. Some who are on this uh, call um, in this webinar today will be participating in it, and we think that this has got tremendous uh, potential co-founded or co-hosted by the Religious Freedom Institute and the Martin Marty Center for the Public Understanding of Religion. So let me close with one more thank you to all of you for this. And we look forward uh, to following up in the days ahead. Thank you so much.